All right. So the topic for today is initial uh, incidental hepatic or liver mass uh, evaluation. It's kind of a broad topic, and I've tried to condense it as best we can. Uh, most of this stuff will actually be uh, covered in the next two weeks in more detail, like the specific diagnosis for uh, you know both the benign and the malignant lesions of uh, of the liver. So this is just will serve as a brief overview. So when you have a, you know most cases you may have on a CT scan done for uh, whatever purpose, you may have an incidental liver lesion or you may find a liver lesion intraoperative. If you're doing a lab call, you may, you may find a liver lesion. So what's the first step in evaluation when you get a call from your radiologist maybe saying that there was a non-contrast CT but uh, when they see an incidental mark mass of the, on the liver. So first uh, step would be to, uh, to sort of get a clinical history for the patient because that can sort of lead you towards the diagnosis. And there's different aspects to clinical history, including gender, age, medication history, past medical history, and any previous history of malignancy. So with regards to age and gender, you know, if you have a pediatric patient who got a CAT scan for whatever reason, be it trauma, be it whatever reason, and you, they see a liver lesion, uh, first uh, diagnosis that should come to your mind should be hepatoblastoma. Usually these will be large. Uh, and that's the most common uh, uh, liver malignancy in the pediatric population. Um, in young females, as, we, as you guys all know, I'm sure hepatic adenoma is a concern, especially in you know women who take oral contraceptive pills. Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, well, you know, it's mostly middle to old age men with who may have a history of hepatitis or cirrhosis. Um, and there's one diagnosis: fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, which, which is, uh, again, one form of hepatocellular carcinoma, but more common in young adults. Um, importantly, um, you know, it's just the hepatocellular, regular hepatocellular carcinoma is uh, more common in males, but for fibrolamellar hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, it is uh, common in both females and males alike. Uh, importantly, there is no underlying pathology of cirrhosis or hepatitis. And uh, importantly, uh, it will have a normal AFP level. We'll cover this in more detail in our in our uh, one of the lectures for uh, for uh, malignant uh, liver lesions in a couple of weeks. But I thought I'll just give you a brief overview. Second aspect to think about is medication use. Um, again, oral contraceptive pills more commonly associated with hepatic adenoma. Importantly, and I've seen a few questions: anabol anabolic steroids. Those are also very commonly associated with hepatic adenoma, and that would be, in, of course, mostly in males, as well as focal nod nodular hyperplasia, as well as uh, HCC. Next thing to consider would be environmental exposure. So PVCs are more commonly associated with angiosarcoma. Uh, patients had a previous history of radiation. Uh, you worry about hepatic lymphoma. Uh, importantly, as an aside, liver is very radio sensitive. So there will be parenchymal toxicity of the liver at about 30 to 35 gray of radiation. Previous medical conditions, importantly, if patients had history of cirrhosis and now has a liver lesion, you know, you worry about hepatocellular carcinoma and the cirrhosis could be alcoholic, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, or cryptogenic. Now we went over the cryptogenic abscess in our last lecture. There is a you know, terminology of cryptogenic cirrhosis, and the most common cause of it is now determined to be NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, is the most common cause of cryptogenic uh, cirrhosis. So if a patient has a history of hepatitis C, you'll have, you know, again, you worry about hepatocellular carcinoma and setting of liver lesion found on imaging, um, as well as hepatitis B. If they have hepatitis B history, they, you know, you can, they can also get hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, there are some distinguishing features between, you know, hepatocellular carcinoma in patients with hepatitis B versus hepatitis C. For hepatitis B, patients do not have, do not usually have a history of cirrhosis, so it's not a progression. For hepatitis C, there's a progression, you get hepatitis C, you get cirrhosis, and then eventually you get hepati hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatitis B is actually a more aggressive uh, pathology, and you don't have to have cirrhosis. And patients can have hepatitis B and initially essentially present with hepatocellular carcinoma directly. Um, one other 
fe distinguishing feature is um, in serine hepatitis, hepatitis cellular carcinoma for hepatitis C, you have, may have multi more commonly you may have multifocal lesions. For hepatitis B, it's usually solitary, but it's large. Um, next is uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis. So that can result in cholangiocarcinoma. So important thing to remember is um, if you have an incidental hepatic mass, say in a setting of a patient with uh, ulcerative colitis, that goes hand in hand with primary scler sclerosing cholangitis. So important thing to keep in mind would be cholangiocarcinoma. Other reasons for malignancy in the liver would be hemochromatosis and Wilson's disease. Again, they both can result in hepatocellular carcinoma. Previous history of malignancy would be important in the setting of incidental liver mass. Um, breast cancer, 40 to 50 percent of the patient with, with breast cancer will eventually develop liver mets. Colorectal cancer, as we most commonly deal with, 35 to 50 percent of the patient with colorectal cancer will develop liver mets. Importantly, GIST, say up to 60% of GIST patients can develop liver mats. So next uh, would be once, you know, you have an incidental mass based on say a non-contrast CT or a CT that, you know, maybe with contrast but it wasn't appropriately timed but there is concern for malignancy or a lesion on the liver and you've sort of reviewed the medical history medication history and stuff to figure out what the potential diagnosis would be. Next step would be imaging, which would be, you know, uh, as we talked about the first step, usually for liver lesions, you would start with an ultrasound. Um, ultrasound is pretty sensitive, about 80 to 85 percent to pick up liver lesions, anything greater than one centimeter, though anything smaller is not as sensitive. Most commonly, ultrasound would tell you whether a lesion is cystic versus solid. Um, um, another significance of ultrasound, for example, is, uh, you know, the, the current guidelines by the American Association for Studies of Liver Disease guideline for uh, hepatitis C, for uh, hepatitis cellular carcinoma surveillance in hep, hep C cirrhosis, the recommendation is that you need to get ultrasound of the liver every six months. So anyone with hepatitis C cirrhosis needs to get an ultrasound of the liver every six months for um, hepatitis <coughs> cellular carcinoma surveillance. Previously, they also used to recommend getting AFP levels along with uh, ultrasound, but the current recommendation actually uh, recommends just getting ultrasound and AFP is not in favor anymore. Uh, so, just, uh, uh, so this is the oral exam. Direct question they ask that do you need AFP? And they're giving you imaging uh, features. Yeah. So I think the safe answer for general surgery will be not the safe, the correct answer will be don't use AFP, AFP the, anymore. Uh, sit down with the radiologist and make a diagnosis. Is That's that correct? Right. Yeah. This would be on your oral oral exam, incidental loma scenario. Next would be getting a CT scan. And again, CT is it's more, much more sensitive, close to 90%, although MRI is the most sensitive of all imaging modalities. So again, there are certain patterns you look for on imaging on contrast studies. For hemangioma, as, as you guys have all read, there is peripheral enhancement with centripetal fill-in, where it starts out, the uh, lights up at the periphery and then gradually fills into the center. F and H, uh, again, characteristic feature would be, um, it will have a bright arterial enhancement, except that it will have a central scar. And most times, you'll actually see central artery. Now these are just giving you an overview because you know next week's lecture would cover the mo most of these uh, diagnoses in much more detail. So we'll have imaging and everything to sort of help distinguish one from the other. But this will, just, as I said, will just serve as a brief overview. Um, hepatic adenoma again will be hypervascular. Um, sometimes it can be hard distinguishing FNH from hepatic adenoma uh, because both will be extremely uh, will enhanced brightly on, arteri on the arterial phase, but again the FNH may have a uh, dominant central artery and then you can further distinguish, thing distinguish the two by an MRI or even, you know, if that's not uh, sort of uh, confirm con confirmatory, then you can even do a biopsy in some cases to confirm for FNH. Um, abscess, as we talked about last week, important thing is if it's a biogenic abscess, you will have a rim enhancement possibly air fluid levels on the CAT scan. If it's an ame amoebic abscess, it's a non-rim enhancement with a, mo uh, and they may even have some edema around the, around the uh, lesion. 
uh, hydrated cyst we talked about, calcified cystic wall as well as daughter cysts. <clears throat> as far as the malignant lesions go, the ones we've talked about so far were benign lesions. For malignancy, of course, we all know the triple phase or four phase CT um, is most uh, sensitive. Um, so important thing to look for is it will, there will be arterial en enhancement and then there's rapid wash out in the portal venous phase. So that is, if you have this in a setting of a patient who has a history of cirrhosis and say they find something, he gets a six monthly surveillance ultrasound, they see a lesion which is say two centimeters. The next step would be to get a triple phase CT. And as long as the, the lesion um, has this characteristic on the CAT scan, arterial enhancement or rapid wash, wash out in the portal venous phase, that's confirmatory for hepatocellular carcinoma. You don't need a biopsy, you don't need any of the tests. You could get an AFP level, um, but again, you know, if, if this, even if the AFP comes back normal, which would be unusual, but even if it's normal, as long as the, the lesion has this characteristic on imaging, um, then you have your diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma. So again, this, this may be on your written boards as well as oral boards. <clears throat> Neuroendocrine tumors, again, they too are hypervascular on the arterial phase, just like hepatocellular carcinoma. But again, the distinguishing factor would be for hepatocellular carcinoma, there's a rapid washout in the portal venous phase, <clears throat> while the neuroendocrine tumors will be obscured in the late venous phase. <clears throat> Metastatic colorectal carcinoma, uh, distinguishing factor it would be it would not enhance as much as neuroendocrine or the hepatocellular carcinoma on the arterial phase. So it will actually be um, less bright the, if it's a metastatic lesion from say colorectal or even breast cancer, <clears throat> these lesions will actually be less bright compared to the normal liver parenchyma versus the other two that will be brighter. <clears throat> MRI, important principle for MRI is, you know, we have T1 and T2 weighted imaging, important for, thing for, to, for you to remember for, for base, it's not specific for liver, it could be any part the, of the body that gets an MRI. T1 weighted imaging, usually fat will show up as bright, fat lesions, lesions containing fat. And for T2, um, water dense lesions appear bright. So, you know, if you want, if you're looking at, say, say well, you want to distinguish, if you think that on an extremity of the lipoma, you get an MRI to make sure it's not a sarcoma or anything. Again, if there is concern, so there'll be T1, T2 imaging, because lipoma is mostly fat, you'll actually, it will light up uh, brighter on the, on the T1. Uh, imaging versus T2 and anything you know containing water lesion, water dense lesions will be such as cysts will appear bright on T2 weighted imaging. <clears throat> MRI is by far the most sensitive uh, imaging modality for liver lesions has 93 to 97 percent sensitivity for hepatocellular carcinoma as well as liver mats. <coughs> Finally you have the nuclear medicine imaging um, you know, there's several different types. You have the Technician 99 Sulfur Colloid, which is, which will help you uh, with the diagnosis of FNH, because FNH contains kufr cells and they will pick up the Sulfur Colloid and you can use this test to, as I said, FNH can sometimes be hard to distinguish uh, from adenomas. And so this may be a good test to do, to, rule, to sort of confirm diagnosis of one from the other. <clears throat> the other test is Technician 99 label red cell scintigraphy. Again, that's conf used mostly for hemangioma. Again, you know, hemangioma has a pretty characteristic uh, sort of feature on CAT scan as we talked about centripetal fill-in. So most times you'll be able to make a diagnosis on the CAT scan, but if there is a doubt, then this is a good study to do. <clears throat> Finally, a PET CT scan. Um, what's important, you know, is that it's not a reliable study for paracellular carcinoma. So if you have it, as I said, the most important study would be your triple phase CT. Um, the PET scan is not usually employed for paracellular carcinoma, nor is it e even employed for pancreatic cancer. It's not considered sensitive for, e for either one of those. Um, and the region is 50% of the paracellular carcinoma are not FDG average. <clears throat> Finally would be a surgical biopsy. When you've had your clinical history, and you've had your appropriate imaging, and you, you know, you're still not sure what it is, um, you'll do a surgical biopsy. Most of, it, most of the time, it's to rule out malignancy. 
Um, and that too would be in a metastatic setting because, you know, as we talked about, the hepatic cell carcinoma has characteristic sort of enhancement on CAT scan. Uh, most of the benign lesions, you know, the only time you could use um, biopsy for benign lesions would be F and H where, you know, you've gone through your ultrasound, CT, MRI, even done the, the nuclear medicine imaging and you still can't, are not sure of the diagnosis. That's one maybe scenario where you could use and you, you know, you suspect it could be F and H. You could use a biopsy to distinguish F and H from, from uh, hepatic adenoma. And the way to distinguish on, on pathology, <clears throat> FNH will actually contain sort of bile ducts on the specimen, hepatic adenoma will not. So that's the distinguishing factor on the pathology between the two. Surgical, <clears throat> uh, most times you'll bi biopsy, say somebody has a history of colorectal cancer, got treated, got chemotherapy, and then six months down the line, maybe has an elevated CEA level, and then you get a CT, uh, abdomen pelvis looking for liver lesions and you find something in that setting you may want to get a biopsy because because in most settings the the oncologist would not want to give chemotherapy unless they have a diagnosis tissue diagnosis <clears throat> so what are the risks associated with surgical biopsy you can have hemorrhage you can have hemobilia you can have bile leak of course there's infection the parenchymal bleeding in the liver though is less than one percent you know, some books talk about seeding from the needle track. Again, that the risk of that is less than one percent. So that pretty much that's that's all I have for today. As I said, this was just a brief overview. We'll be going through specific diagnosis, benign next week, malignant the week after. So we'll talk more about the imaging. Specifically, we'll have some more imaging. If you have any <clears throat> guys have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Go ahead. Yeah. The slide where you had the breast cancer as a 50%, is that like lifelong despite That's right. treatment? That That's, right. That's right. Thanks for doing this. You cannot uh, underestimate the importance of all slides. This will be on your written exam as well as oral. This is a very high yield topic for this whole month. For the chiefs who are sitting this year, you'll, they will just give you an uh, incident uh, of an image of a one cut of a CT scan of a liver mass. <coughs> Then you have to ask for it, I need a liver dedicated protocol. And then you, they go, the whole scenario goes into different bifurcations. Like what if adenoma, what if HCC? And the AFP question was asked to me in my exam. The doc, you don't need AFP. And thanks to, we, because we were discussing and I said, sir, uh, there's a, we don't need for confirmation. It can be an adjunct, but not for confirmation that he chuckled and he moved on. So because in the past, the, the knee jerk reaction is AFP. So be aware of these few things which are happening so that you don't get caught in a, in a situation that you're dogmatic, I need an AFP, when the answer is the other way around. Okay, you have a question, Alex? I was wondering, will that kind of guide you to biopsying healthy tissue? Like say it's pre-opted, someone with a known HCC, you know, like would you, would you biopsy healthy tissue to see if they would, you know, if the remnant would be good enough? Like they say, cirrhotic patient. Oh, you're talking about the uh, FLH, functional liver FLR. Right. Well, they were trying to get you go that yeah. direction. Yeah. Let, uh, uh, Probably not, but I mean, biopsy, biopsy wouldn't be the way in that case. In any case, I mean, there are both the volumetric studies as we look at, and the special program that come in. They will sort of, you know, you use the CAD scan to get the basic uh, sort of, you know, anatomy, and then there are volumetric uh, the programs that evaluate based on the blood supply of, of the entire liver, what's healthy and what's not. So <clears throat> so even if they, they go down their route and says, you know, say 80% of the liver is affected, what are you going to do? Or they may give you a picture and say, would you resect this? So the way to go would be to, 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 to ask them to get volumetric studies of the uh, remnant liver. So they wouldn't want to, biopsy wouldn't be the way to go. And uh, the same like AFP, there's another trauma scenario, the zone 2 uh, pendering trauma. Uh, you don't have to explore if the patient is stable. You can do CT angio and do the uh, endoscopy as well. That's another common pitfall because the knee-jerk reaction is zone 2 pending trauma, patient stable, you go to the OR. No, you, we have time to image, have a road map. So AFP is in... I think there's common scenarios which are, you know, in the old teaching has been on the book still say AFP, but be aware of these traps, you know. I thought I may have time. I just had a couple of questions about the 
hepatic abscess that we did last time, and I thought I'll just sort of go over with that. I just got two. So all the following are true regarding comparisons of amoebic and pyogenic liver abscess, except amoebic abscess have, have a much higher male preponderance. Mortality rates are similar. Both are more likely to occur in the right lobe. Percutaneous aspiration is more likely needed for pyogenic abscess, and pyogenic abscess are more likely to be multiple. So which one is the correct answer for this business? This is, this is asking for something that's not going to sit, it's yeah, accept. abscess is up to 20 percent. Mortality for amoebic abscess is about 3 to 4 percent. If you remember with regards to the male preponderance, I, I don't know if you remember from last time, I said usually for pyogenic abscess it's mostly women, middle-aged women who are diabetic that are most commonly get it. For amoebic abscess it's mostly young males who have <coughs> travel history or historians, they will be the ones. So this is correct. Right lobe is the one that most, the, most likely gets affected. Percutaneous aspiration more commonly in pyogenic abscess. And pyogenic abscess more likely to be multiple because, you know, they may, as we talked about, biliary is the most important cause. Biliary infections presenting as liver abscesses or diverticulitis or, or appendicitis, which are not common as much anymore. And the next one is this. So. 30-year-old Hispanic with a history of alcohol abuse presents with high fever, right upper portal pain, and leukocytosis. Ultrasound shows a 5-centimeter fluid collection right at the lower of the liver. <coughs> CT fluid collection shows a peripheral rim of edema. The cause of fluid collection is most likely to be determined by. So what do you think is the diagnosis first? Maybe <coughs> That's right, serology. That's right. So we talked about it last time again, if it's a pyogenic abscess, you will have rim enhancement around the, around the lesion. For amoebic abscess, it's, there is no rim enhancement, but there is surrounding edema. So, you know, this, this will clinch the diagnosis, the peripheral rim of edema essentially clinches the diagnosis for amoebic abscess. That's pretty much what I have for today. Any questions?